Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. So we begin at the end, but actually we're going to begin at the beginning today. So we'll just uh, we'll just start right in by talking about your amazing novel. Um, Okay, first of all, tell listeners, this is your third novel, what this is about and what inspired you to write it, please. Okay, so the book we begin at the end. Um, it's a story that follows kind of the year and a year in the life of a thirteen-year-old girl named Duchess, um, as she tries to protect her family in the wake of a um, of a convicted killer moving back to the small California town that she lives in, and um, and kind of in doing so, she sets off this this chain of events that kind of wreck everything around her and. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like, it's hard to describe, but I, I describe it as a coming of age crime story. Um, some people say it's a mystery. Some people say literary fiction. Um, it's probably a book about, it's a book about sacrifices you know, um, that people make to, for those that they love. And it's about making mistakes and learning how to move on from them. It's a book about life. That's my pitch. That was a good one. I like it. <laughs> Way to bring in a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> I cover all the bases. Yeah. Who, who does that not appeal to now? I mean, there you go. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested in life, you will like my book. Yeah. Ex- yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that as a blurb now. Yeah. There you go. Um, so how did you start writing to begin with? Let's go back to that. Because I read in your bio, you're like, a, you're in finance, right? So how did- I was in finance. Yeah. So I'm going to take- I'm going to take you all the way back. Good, to, let's go. Right, so I messed up at school, didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I was kind of always jealous of my, like my friends knew, you know, if someone wanted to be doctors, lawyers, things like that. And I just had no idea what I was going to do. But um, the night before my economics exam, I got really drunk and um, woke up in hospital. So I missed the exam. So I completely wrecked all my chances <laughs> of going to university. Um, my parents were thrilled about that. And... Um, and then I bounced from job to job. You know, I worked in a bakery and a supermarket. I loved working in a bakery. I worked in a supermarket. I sold electrical cable. I was working as an estate agent, a real estate agent. And I was out dropping leaflets through people's doors. And um, someone came up to me and asked if they could borrow my phone. And, you know, when you kind of get a bad feeling, you know, this is going to go badly. And then they asked for my wallet and <laughs> and I put up a fight. <laughs> yeah. So I put up a fight because I've always been a massive boxing fan. So I thought I'll fight him. But um, just because you watch boxing doesn't mean you can box, as I found out. But um, he I kind of held my own for a while. And then he pulled out a kitchen knife and stabbed me in the side a few times. And yeah, it was really bad. And I dropped the phone, dropped my wallet. He picked up everything and ran off. And I was kind of left standing there bleeding and got myself to the hospital. They stitched me back together again. And I was okay, you know, physically. I've still got the scars and stuff. I tell, I make up different stories to my kids about what happened all the time, like a shark bite and things like that, something really cool. And, and then I, I had a really tough time after that. You know, I didn't know anything about PTSD. And um, my, my kind of friends, my dad slapped me on the back. You know, you did well, it was a brave thing to do and um I couldn't couldn't kind of handle what had happened and so I went through a really tough time and I remember like sitting down to read a book and being stuck on the same chapter the same page for hours on end you know watching tv just couldn't focus on anything I'd go out running and I'd run so far that I'd have to get a bus back home um which you know it's just it was this really strange time and I I wasn't eating I wasn't sleeping but I kind of projected that I was okay because you know everyone expected me to be okay and and things got really bad and I started um 
I was just, you know, in, you know when you haven't slept for ages and ages and you kind of don't feel yourself. So you can be in a room full of people and you just feel like you're not there, you're not connected to anyone. And I felt like that for ages. And I um, um, felt really depressed. Like I'd look in the mirror and not recognize the person that I saw. You know, I didn't want to be that person. And I started hoarding painkillers and I thought I'm just going to just take a load, you know, just end things. And then I sat down and I was going to write a note to my parents just to explain like how I was feeling and what had happened. And um, I'd read something about writing as therapy, um, how you can you can take the, the thing that happened to you, the traumatic incident, and you can change the characters involved. And um, and I gave it a try and I sat down that night and wrote and I wrote the character of Duchess who's in We Begin at the End. Um, obviously I didn't know she was Duchess, I just wrote about this girl that had kind of the weight of the world on her shoulders, everything was going wrong for her, she looked like a victim and, and then that night I slept for the first time in ages and and then I wrote some more the next day, some more the next day, and it was a long process, but I felt a bit better, you know, and I was able to, to kind of dealing, deal with things. And probably a year or two passed of me just writing bits and pieces. They were, it was kind of disjointed. It wasn't the beginning of a book or anything like that. It was just this girl and her life and her troubles and things like that. And I was kind of projecting everything that was happening to me onto someone else and it, it, it helped. And then I read an article about a stockbroker in the newspaper and there was a picture of him and he had this Ferrari and it was like this dream life. And I thought, I'm going to be a stockbroker, which is ridiculous because I'm terrible at maths and I had no qualifications or anything like that. So I, I went into the city, printed my CV, which was terrible, marched into the city, managed to talk my way into a job. I don't know how. I think they took pity on me. I really do. I think they looked at my CD, my CV, and felt sorry for me. So they they gave me a job, and I worked my way up. Loved it. Loved working in the city. I was a stockbroker for ages, and but I really wanted to be a trader. I wanted to work on a trading desk. And um, eventually, so I was about twenty four. I um, my boss called me and said, "We're going to give you a chance on the trading desk, but if you lose twenty thousand dollars, stop trading. We'll talk about what went wrong." So I said, fine. And then the next day I came in and lost two million dollars. Oh no. And I know, I know. And I didn't and I didn't tell anyone again. Oh, and no. I, I, said, I know. So one of my friends worked in the back office and I said to him, let's don't tell anyone about this. I will make it back, which is ridiculous again, because you know it's two million dollars. I don't really know what I'm doing. So I lost a bit more, carried on trading, and eventually got. I, I went into work one morning and, and the bosses were sitting around a boardroom table with lawyers and things like that. And, and they sat me down and I'd started to make money at this point, you know, so I went on quite a good run and they sat me down and said, we know what's happened. We know everything. And they kind of said, we can go to the police or you can, you can sign a contract and you can pay us back half of it out of your own pocket and we'll let you carry on trading. So I signed it and I went home that day as a 24 year old with a million dollars in debt. And I was getting married, I was engaged at the time and my wife thought we were doing really well. You know, this is all, I was projecting this image again that I was really successful. And so the wedding costs were spiraling and I had this, you know, this terrible secret and I felt like a complete screw up. You know, I couldn't talk to anyone about it. And I went back to writing again. You know, I started, like we were looking at churches in the day and in the evening I'd be checking my life insurance policy and stuff because I just couldn't, I was back like, how I felt when I'd just been stabbed and all that happened, I felt like that again. You know, like I can't cope with this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to tell anyone about it. So I, um, on our honeymoon, I was writing, writing more Duchess, more of that character. And then I, went back to work, worked for years, worked very hard, paid it off, got to my third, just before my 30th birthday and was about to get a promotion. And then I read a book called The Last Child by an author called John Hart, which I loved. It was a brilliant, brilliant book. And, um, and then I read an interview with John Hart and he talked about how he turned his back on 
a career in law, like a successful law career, to write his book. So right there and then I quit my job. Like my boss called me and offered me the promotion. I said, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm miserable. Quit my job. My wife was pregnant at the time and a student, so we had no money. So I came home and said to her, I'm going to write a book, which she, she didn't know I'd written ever written anything. So it's another one of those, you know, it's completely, it sounds completely mad. But she was really supportive and she knew I wasn't happy. And, and I suppose it's kind of striking that balance, isn't it, of, of doing something that makes you happy and doing something that you love and supporting your family. And we, we sold our house, car, changed our life completely, moved to Spain for a while where I wrote my debut book, Tall Oaks. And I didn't even know that you needed a literary agent or a publishing deal or how any of it works. I just kind of just knew that I wanted to write. So I wrote this book, came back to London, luckily got an agent, got a publishing deal. The book was published. We went to this, got nominated for an award, like this fancy award ceremony we went to. And I was completely out of my depth. It was like all people big name authors in black tie and things like that and and then my book won against like it was the longest of long shots and um we got back to the hotel and my wife just burst into tears and she was um yeah because it had been really tough for her as well you know it'd been she had been watching me kind of go through all this stuff and and yeah so that that almost brings us up to date and then I wrote another book before I I thought about going back to Duchess again you know off and on and I didn't it wasn't a story that I ever thought I'd share and it wasn't, I didn't think it'd be a book, but um, I had some help from Amy Einhorn, my editor and the team at Holt, you know, they're amazing. And yeah, and she, I, I gave her a very rough draft of this story and she helped me to get it into the shape it's in now. You know, there's a finished book, which I have here. And I know no one can see this, but I'm holding up the book. And yeah, so it's been, it's been a long journey from from then to now and now I get to talk to you about it which is really cool whoa <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that was amazing I don't want you to stop talking about that I want you to like wait go know, back to the, feel... go back to the second book I feel like you skimmed past the second book tell me about that yeah. one. so the second book all the wicked girls is a book set in Alabama and it's about um, twin sisters one of them goes missing and then this this is a small town in Alabama and this cloud appears over it and it's not supernatural in any way but it just stays there and it gets darker and darker till it's night time 24 hours a day and um, it's kind of kind of a metaphor for what's going on in the town and there's a lot of religious connotations and things like that and yeah so that came out and then but I had this book I had we begin at the end kind of there and I kind of fought the urge to write it for years and years because I knew it would be difficult and it, it was it was difficult <laughs> it was so probably of the years it took to write um most of those were Duchess the character of Duchess and getting her her dialogue right probably a solid year spent just writing and rewriting her dialogue and and it becomes that agony you know I'd, I'd draft a paragraph up and then delete it and rewrite it then change a single word then lie lie awake at night um just worrying that it's not as good as it can be and and I just refused to send it, you know, if I didn't feel that I couldn't, I had to feel like I couldn't write a better sentence in that book before anyone could read it, which is madness, because uh, I could read it back now and change loads of stuff, you know, which I would do, because I'm like that. But yeah, it's, it's been a long, strange journey. And I feel like I've just talked at you for ages. <laughs> really I loved sorry. it. That was great. Thank you. I was yeah. like totally in the mood just to listen. I'm like listening to my own podcast. It's perfect. Um, <laughs> wow. What a story. But the funny thing is like, you would never know. I mean, you would never know anything. First of all, why are you writing stories based in the US? Like, what is that about? Yeah. Like, I okay. thought before I knew anything about you and I was just like reading the book at first, I was like, I was like, wait, I was, I kept looking. I was like, well, is he, is he American, but he's living in London? Like that must be it. And I was like, no, it looks like he's actually British. What's going on? Cause this is yeah. like, a, it's like a, um, Americana almost. It's anyway. It yeah. It's, um, it's partly. So when I'm reading a book, I like to escape totally. You know, I, I like to move to a different area, you know, in my mind. And partly that was true for writing when I sat down, because I was having such a tough time, 
I needed to set a story a long way away from my life. And America, so I went to America when I was a kid with my dad and we did the theme parks. Like my parents split up when I was quite young and I missed seeing my dad quite a lot. And he took, took me and my brother to the theme parks in America. And it was the best time I think I've ever had, you know? And I look back on it fondly, you know, if I'm looking for a happy memory, I go back to that place. And, and we, I kind of grew up, you know, we watch a lot of your TV shows and read a lot. You know, I grew up reading Dennis Lehane and Stephen King and John Grisham and, you know, the masters of, of kind of their genre. And, and it, it felt right and I needed, so we begin at the end, it's a massive story. You know, it didn't start out that way, but it spans a year in the life of this girl and, and, a, and a policeman. And, and I needed this kind of big canvas to tell it on. And America was just, it's such an amazing country. It feels like a world within a country, you know, and, and there's a point where Duchess goes on this big road trip at the end of the book. She starts in Montana and she ends up in California and it just wouldn't have worked anywhere else. It's just, yeah, it, it's, it's hard though. You know, I don't know. I do a lot of research and yeah, I feel like I just, I set out to make it as difficult as I possibly can for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I succeed but again you know I have an amazing copy editor and and team that catch my mistakes and and I work in a library as well a few days a week so I use all this the, the resources I have there I'm forever looking at maps and reading books and travel guides and I get obsessive about it you know it needs to feel authentic so have you not actually been to these places in the book no I haven't you so. haven't been there oh <laughs> my gosh not. I know. So, so the towns are fictional, but they're, they're, the locations they're in are real places. So I'll build my town in my head and on the screens and then I'll plonk it down somewhere, somewhere real. And so you have this beautiful town called Cape Haven on the coast in California. And um, the cliffs are eroding. So every now and then part of the town slides into the sea and it kind of mirrors the cat. There's a character called Walk, um, a police chief, and he is battling. He's not very well. And he's kind of, he was happiest when he was a teenager and he lived in this perfect town and now everything's kind of changing and he can't handle it. And yeah, it was, I, I loved writing that. And Duchess goes to Montana for a big chunk of the story. And it was, um, it was so much fun writing that. It was like, I'd, I'd have a really tough day and then get back to my office and sit down and, and escape to Montana. And so when I was at, when I was a kid and I was at Disney World, we were in the line in a queue to go on a ride and we were behind this family and we got talking to them my dad was talking to the dad and he was telling us we had to visit Montana and he said it's like switching from portrait to landscape and, and that stuck in my head you know all these years later I just think it's so I, I I'd always wanted to write a book set there and, and I do want to visit as well but I'm supposed to be in New York in a couple of weeks but it's not happening because no one can go anywhere really can they so I'm hoping later in the year because I yeah I haven't been to America since I was 21. Oh my gosh is, yeah too long ago now. Wow. Well I recently went to Montana not that recently um for the first time so I can send you some pictures if you would like. Yeah um, I would love that I would really to, love uh, that. Um, yeah my brother is it spends beautiful? a lot of time there. It's gorgeous it's really yeah. gorgeous. Um, I can imagine I'm doing an interview with the Montana press people later this week <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think they're going to get me for something I think they're going to test me on that oh yeah, my gosh on, wow, on Montana. So, wow yeah, switching from portrait to landscape I love that I can't believe you even yeah. remember something said online at Disney World when you were a child that's crazy I, I mean yeah I barely well, I don't remember that. much else I just have these, <laughs> have these certain um, things that you know when you just you don't know why you've remembered something but yeah, you no, know, I was not. so so when I was reading it, I was so struck by the way I was trying to figure out what you were doing in your writing to keep the reader so like on the edge of their seat, right? What tools you were using. And I feel like it's because you had such short paragraphs, like every mm -hmm. new line. It was like every line was a new paragraph and it just kept going like boom, boom, boom. So you never got like it was it was like in page 200 or something you first had like a really long dense paragraph and then I was like wait there are no paragraphs like everything is very short um and so it makes it like um it, the pacing of it ma it makes it 
sort of very rapid. Was that intentional or that just happened? Um, it's something I'm not aware that I'm doing. It's something that gets point, pointed out to me now and by my the editorial team and things like that, but I'm not really. I just sit down and write and I build a scene. Like I work across three screens and I build the scene that I'm going to write on the screens, you know, with photos and things like that. And I need to, I, I want to feel what they're feeling before I write anything. So it, yeah, it's a long process, but as for the actual physical, you know, the actual writing of it, I don't know. It just is the way that I write. And it's, um, yeah, I don't, I've had friends, I have friends that are author friends that have done courses and things like that. And, um, you know, creative writing courses and, and I always feel like they know a lot more than I do you know, about, about how to do it and how to plan and how to, you know, execute a novel. And, and yeah, I don't, it just happens. And it happens that, you know, I probably wrote the book twice over, you know, hundreds of thousands of words before it starts being cut back again. Um, so basically, Zibby, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just, it's just, I'm just winging it hoping for the best. <laughs> I mean, nobody really knows what they're doing. So it's just, you just have to either admit it or deny it. Um, so you might yeah. as well come clean. And I exactly. feel like your entire narrative is like, um, it's like against all odds or like, look what happened to me by mistake. Or like, yeah. you know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> you, it's like it. you were trying to, to not be successful in some way, right? You kept like hindering yourself. Like, yeah, it does feel yet, like that. Yeah. And I kind of, yeah, and I kind of think I wrote Duchess in that way, you know, because you've got this girl that kind of keeps screwing up all the time and making these terrible decisions and, and you keep rooting for her and she's, she's, she's the sole carer to her, her mum's an, an addict and her younger brother is kind of in her charge, you know, she, she has to cook for him and care for him and she can't really do that for herself and she doesn't really know, you know, childhood, she has nothing like that in her life and um you know what kind of reading about a child struggling is quite an emotive thing I think and you kind of you, you kind of rooting for her the whole time you know that she's gonna against all odds is gonna get her happy ending that she deserves you had this scene um where her mom was being attacked um mm -hmm. with and you said her mother was screaming and she's trying to figure out how to handle it should she call the cops um dark is like stealing the receiver the phone from her um and it is so intense right and she's debating and you're like in it with her like what mm -hmm. is she gonna do is she gonna escape there's this big strong man like terrifying her the mother's like you know is she gonna come fight for her i mean this is like massive like tension and um a lot to put on the shoulders of a child um and then of yeah. course how can you not then go on in the book or in the in duchess's life without all of that like heaped on and that's just one little scene mm -hmm. yeah it's um yeah she has a tough time and she um and her mum teaches her at a young age that um you know selfless acts are what make you a good person and that is kind of the one thing that her mum teaches her and it kind of it sticks in her mind throughout the story and she kind of spends spends most of the book looking for her selfless act you know in a way to prove to herself that she's not bad you know she's not a bad person and um and though she does these terrible things and um and she's got a foul mouth you know she she curses a lot <laughs> she um she's just a kid you know trying to get by and um she's just been dealt a losing hand and she's yeah trying to um trying to change her she doesn't even really care about herself it's her little brother you know she wants the best for him and she wants she wants to, him to have his happy ending and um even if that means that she doesn't get hers and yeah she do you, do you have a little brother i have an older brother yeah i am um, i'm the youngest and i have a step siblings as well and they're older as well so i've always been the baby <laughs> huh. yeah um interesting mm -hmm. Um, so are you, would you ever write a memoir of your experience? Have you written about it? And um, I wrote something that went in something similar to, to the story I just told you and it ended up in the Guardian over here. And um, my parents read it and that was the first time they'd ever heard any of that story. And, they, so, oh my God. and I got a call, yeah, and I got a call from my dad and he was, um, you know, what, what is this, is this true? And 
you know it was a strange <laughs> strange time because I think I think you know you think you know your children you know me as a parent you know my kids are quite young but I I think I would hate to read something like that in the paper you know and feel like they they couldn't come to me about something but um yeah I felt like it was mine you know it was my problem to deal with I'd got myself into this mess um not so much the the stabbing but the um the trading side of it you know yeah I got myself into this mess and and I needed to find a way out wow. and yeah and I want, well I, just, I think that should be a book I think you should write that as yeah a, yeah you pick, pick whatever place in the United States you could pretend I don't know. <laughs> but um I think I mean that story was riveting to me I mean I mean the book was also riveting and amazing but um I don't know the fact that it's a true story from the sucker yeah from the sucker it, um drama. yeah there's yeah a lot went into it a lot yeah. went into that book you know it feels like it's been 20 years in the making and um yeah and there's a lot you know it's a book it is a book about families you know and about not having anyone there you feel like you can talk to and and how that can change as you get older and yeah it was um wow. it was a long time coming so do you have another book in you are you working already on another one um yeah I'm about to yeah I'm about to start work on the new book that I'm supposed to deliver I think at Christmas but I mean that's, it's not going to happen so. <laughs> <laughs> and I use um yeah I, I'll use this platform Zibby to tell my editor that I'm going to miss my deadline <laughs> she can find out on the podcast yeah, um. <laughs> I'll just email her the transcript ahead of time give her a little heads up or something yeah yeah, yeah, do that when I and I'll um, switch my phone off for a while. <laughs> that will work out perfectly. I'll BCC you. I will. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, do you have any advice um, to aspiring authors? Yeah, um, I clearly don't know what I'm doing, but I will tell you one thing that's helped me. Um, my agent said, um, you know, right at the beginning when I signed with her, she said, um, if you're not enjoying it, you're doing something wrong, and that's kind of stuck with me because. You know, you, you get a say you get a level of success with a book and people want to read it and and you start to feel the pressure of writing another book, you know, and delivering something and you get deadlines and you get PR commitments and things like that. And you for, I think it's easy to forget why you did it in the first place, you know, and what you know, it's something that you, you do because you love. And and I try and remember that all the time because when I'm in the kind of the eye of the storm it's hard to see out sometimes and it's you know I forget how much I love it how much I love telling stories wow. and entertaining people and, and that's why I do it wow is this going to be a movie by the way um when does this go out the podcast um I don't know I have to look uh, I think in oh, like okay. two weeks two weeks maybe oh, okay that's fine then yeah because it's not announced till tomorrow but Disney have just bought the, <laughs> bought the rights no way I know so I had this I had this crazy time where I was meeting all these Hollywood studios and you know I live in a small town in the UK and work in the library so this is a world away from my life and and then yeah and I I'm a believer in heart overhead you know in general and gut feeling and things like that and but Disney was you know I just it's Tommy Kale who directed Hamilton and I, I thought Hamilton was a masterpiece mm -hmm. um, and he's such a lovely guy and yeah we just hit it off and it felt right and That's him amazing. and Jennifer and their team they're just yeah they're amazing so it's very yeah. exciting and it's so full circle with your theme trip to the, the to Disney World <laughs> it's like yeah. perfect so I just need for them to pay to send my kids to Disney World <laughs> I need to put that in the contract wow I mean, I'll take your kids to Disney World if you really yeah. want. You could. I have four kids. You could just like throw them in the back seat, and I wouldn't even notice they were there. <laughs> yeah, if you could raise them as well, that'd be nice. Send them back when they've um. Yeah, because my we've got a seven month old, and her first tooth has just appeared this Aww. morning. So, <laughs> I know, but oh she's all of a sudden she's turned into a monster. She was very sweet and loving, <laughs> and now she's um angry and aggressive. Oh. Yeah. You have to like she rub a little it. Jack Daniels on it or something. Yeah. Yeah, some for her, some for me. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This was so much fun. And um, thank you for this fantastic book and congratulations on bringing Duchess into the world, really. Um, and now I'll to see her on the screen. That'll be so cool. And yeah. just congrats. This is amazing. Thank you very much for having me. It was, it was fun. my pleasure. All right. And sorry to your editor for the delay. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 